We get our ideas for our books from many different places, uh, from childhood experiences. Um, when our children were growing up, we have incidents that happened that have given us ideas for books, like Messy Bessie. Uh, we've, we have the idea that comes out of history, uh, our own lived history plus um, history of the past. So we get them from just comments sometimes, just overhear a comment and say, oh wow, that sounds like a good book. You know, tell the truth no matter how much it hurts other people. <laughs> and out of that came the honest to goodness truth. So books come from, from all kinds of places. Um, I guess uh, we have said over and over that, uh, that ideas uh, are two different natures. One is, is the instant idea, uh, idea that just seems to come to you and it really doesn't take any time whatsoever. And the other type of idea is one that you work on and work on and work on. We've even named them the Athenian idea that kind of pops right into your head like the birth of Athena. Mm -hmm. And the mustard seed idea that kind of grows slowly over time and over period. So out of our ideas has even come stories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well really what, what most people want to know is do we fight? <laughs> uh, our collaborative work is, is truly a collaboration. Um, Fred doesn't have to send me a memo. He knows what is needed and gets the work done for the research and the gathering of material. And then I take it and do a rough draft, leaving gaping holes where I think information ought to be. Uh, and then he comes back in and fills that in. Then we read it and recycle and read and recycle until we finally get it to where we're both satisfied with it. Well, I guess to say it simply, we talk a lot. <laughs> and uh, when we're not talking, we, you know, we are just out observing the world as it is. When, we, when we've worked and we, we hit a rough spot, we, we'll just go take a drive up in the country or down by the, we live on the Mississippi River mm. and we drive along Highway 3 which is along the river and we don't talk, we just observe and watch and rest the mind and you'd be surprised that on the way back from that trip we're mm. talking non-stop about how to solve a problem that we've mm. run into or whatever um, but we work together mm at home, in our office, Fred has his desk and his mm. work and I have mine and we're not attached at the hip, although we work very, very closely mm. together. For one reason or other, we found ourselves at Nantucket. And as we got off the boat uh, at Nantucket, I'll never will forget it, uh, uh, Ray Charles was singing. <laughs> <laughs> and we went to the museum. That's just, you know, just how crazy things are. And the first picture when we got to the museum was of a black naval captain of a whaling ship. And we we just like to fell over <laughs> because uh, of all the things that, you know, that you would have to do to to uh, run your boat around in, in the Atlantic Ocean and get back, that's quite complicated. Uh, and here, I guess in the 16th century, uh, maybe in the 16th century, uh, here's an African American who, who is a captain of a naval ship. And well, this, uh, this doesn't fit with the facts that we have been given. Uh, not at all. So uh, we got interested in whaling. And uh, from there, uh, we found out that. Uh, uh, that uh, African Americans had been in whaling, I guess, uh, since, since the 1700s. Mm -hmm. And in the later days of, of the industry, uh, uh, they comprised 90% of it. And it took us all over looking for, looking for them. We went to uh, Seattle, we went to Monterey, to the Maritime Museum there, mm -hmm. down to Barbados. Uh, we just, we went 
-hmm. wherever we could find, because there wasn't that much written about it, so we had to do original, original uh, research, which means you have to go to the, mm -hmm. to the places and actually dig it up and find it yourself. So we did that, but we were so proud of the outcome of that book, um, which was a Coretta Scott King honor book, mm -hmm. and I'm very proud of that. We also learned that these whaling ships were, the, the Underground Railroad was not a railroad or a train, but a ship. A ship. <laughs> and that they were the ones that did a lot of the, uh, the runs with, with slaves down in the barrels and in the holes of those ships. The reason why I will write a historical fiction piece is because I can't put all of the facts together to make the story nonfiction. So I'll fictionalize that part that I'm unable to make all the hinges fit. I'll use Runaway Home as an example of how I used nonfiction material to create a fictional book and why it is realistic. Um, we believe in our family that an ancestor of ours is an Apache Indian. The part of Alabama that my family lived in is right at Pensacola, where Alabama and Florida and Georgia come together. Well, they, the train tracks went right through there. The Crossleys found and raised an Indian, they said, and his name was Abraham. They never said who or where he came from, but that he was found. This is the story. Well, I have visited all over everywhere trying to find out if there's any documentation where he might have come from. We were unable to find anything. But in the process, I learned an awful lot about the Apache Indians. So I wrote a nonfiction book about the Apaches in the True Book series. And then I wrote uh, a historical fiction book about my ancestor. And I called it Runaway Home. And I used all the information that I had learned about the removal of the Apaches from the Southwest. When I started writing a number of years ago, uh, there were very few books for, by, and about the African American experience for children in picture books, beginning readers, novels, fiction or nonfiction. Virginia Hamilton, who was my mentor and quite helpful, Jim Haskins, who had, had almost single handedly documented the stories of African American musicians and uh, Walter Dean Myers, who the uh, juvenile novel had made, brought young boys to reading. So there were some African-American writers out there, but they alone could not represent all the stories that should be told, needed to be told. So when we entered the scene, what we tried to do was to fill a niche, and our niche was that time period between 1800 and 1900. That's pre-Civil War, Civil War, post-Civil War, up through and until the Harlem Renaissance. And we just carved that out as our niche. And we worked very, very hard to try to tell that story. And I hope that what we've done is to make our history a little bit clearer something that is not, something that doesn't make the children feel ashamed or hurt. It is not designed to point a finger or to make some child in the classroom feel responsible for all that happened back then. But we can't shovel it under the rug and say that those things did not happen. They did. But let's tell it by telling an even-handed, well-researched, well-documented story. And that's what we tried to do in Days of Jubilee, mm -hmm. Rebels Against Slavery, um, Going Someplace Special, and um, 
even even the uh, whalemen, um, white hands, black, I mean, black hands, white sails. Writing for children is, I, f I feel as though it is a special trust that has been given to us and that we must protect and guard it diligently. You just don't put anything in a book for young readers. It did not come to us easy as writers yeah. because writing for children doesn't mean you write like a seventh grader. You write for the yeah. seventh grader. And you have to think like they think to a degree, but then you have to write like a professional who's writing for children. And so very often, that was one of the pitfalls that we found, is that we got a little bit too chatty or, you know, it was cute. But you don't want to be cute in a book because it will date. You can't use too much slang. You can't, all of that. So we had to learn how to, to write in a professional mm. way so that the quality of your book holds, holds true all the way through. I remember um, there was a, a, a teacher who wrote um, a story about the children be, being afraid of the monster in the computer room. And the teacher said to her, she was working on her master's, and she wrote about this horrible computer room this is when computers were relatively new. And the teacher said, no, you're afraid of the computer room and the monster in there, not your children. Your children don't see it as a monster. You do. So you've got to start your stories where your kids are, not where you are, but where your kids are. And then you go on and tell the stories. That's why Walter Dean Myers is so successful that's why so many of our writers today who are at the top of the charts, because they, they start where the kids are and then go from there, okay? And, and they, they, know, they know where their heads are and what they're thinking about. That doesn't mean they condone or whatever, but it means they start where their interests, where their interests start. Most uh, people that we have been around with, uh, don't really understand uh, that uh, what the power of story is. Uh, and I think it's best illustrated by, uh, again, an Einstein type of, uh, he was asked to uh, one of the great questions, what should mankind be doing now that will benefit him later in, in, the, f in the future, him or her? whoever mankind might be. Uh, but, and he answered, and he says, read to the children's story. So the person interviewing him uh, didn't quite understand that. They wanted to move on. He said, well, Mr. Einstein, what else do you think you should be doing? He said, read more stories to your children. And I don't think he ever got it. But the power of story is just, beyond, you know, it's, it's beyond the idea. What it does, it prepares children for making adult decisions and, and, and developing their problem-solving skills. Um, without story, you're not connected to anything. I mean, think of yourself as being the little red hen. You've been there. <laughs> you've, you've done all the work for the committee, and then they show up for the photo op. Huh. Well, that's the little red hen. Of course it is, the boy who cried wolf. We know that story. And we've seen it act out in life. And we react and respond to those situations based on what we were taught in those stories. And so we needed to tell, you, know, you have to tell old stories so that we don't lose the connection and we have to tell new stories. We have to meet children where they are with new stories. This book, Go In Someplace Special, which was uh, illustrated by Jerry Pinkney, um, is autobiographical. It's about when I was growing up um, in Nashville, my grandmother and I used to go to uh, a very special place once a, once a week. 
And uh, to get there, we had to go through, through town and we rode the bus and came back around. Now, this is the South, the Nashville of the segregated South. That was a time when, this, when, when Nashville was segregated based on racial lines. There were so many places that blacks could not go, and they had to ride the back of the bus. So when I started out begging my grandmother to let me go downtown by myself, she always said, no, you have to go with me, because they didn't want us to be hurt by those circumstances. They kind of buffered it with us, and so I was not allowed to go. But then one time I asked if I could go, and she said, okay, I'm going to let you go this one time. But you walk and hold your head up and act like you belong to somebody. Well, that meant that, you know, I was to behave and that I was to, to hold my head up and be on my proper behavior. So when I got on the bus, I had to get on the back of the bus. When I got to Peace Fountain, um, I couldn't sit on the park bench there. I was so disappointed when I went past and looked at the hotel and I would have loved to have gone in, but I couldn't. I couldn't go to the restaurant. So I, I was just, you know, just discouraged. And so I met a woman there who used to take care of the gardens. She didn't do it by permission or for money, she just did it because she was there. We used to call her Bloom and Mary. And she um, kind of encouraged me to keep going no matter what. She kind of repeated what my grandmother said. So I'll pick up the story at that point. Two blocks later, Trisha Ann came to the Grand Music Palace where a group had gathered for the matinee performance. As the girl approached, a little boy spoke to her. Howdy, I'm Hickey, and I'm six years old today. You coming in? Before Trish Ann could answer, an older girl grabbed his, his hand. Hush, boy, she said through clenched teeth. Colored people can't come in the front door. They got to go around back and sit up in the buzzard's roots. Don't you know nothing? His sister whispered harshly. Hickey looked at Trish Ann with wide, wondering eyes. Are you going to sit up there in the last three rows of the balcony? Why, I wouldn't sit up there even if watermelons bloomed in January. Besides, I'm going to some place very, very special, she answered. And then Trish Ann skipped away. I want to go where she's going, she heard Hickey say as his pull sister pulled him through the door. At the corner, Trish Ann saw a building rising above all that surrounded it, looking proud in the summer sun. It was much more than bricks and stone. It was an idea. Mama Frances called it a doorway to freedom. When she looked at it, she didn't feel angry or hurt or embarrassed. At last, Trish Ann whispered, I've made it to someplace special. Before bounding up the steps and through the front door, she stopped to look up at the message chiseled in stone across the front facing. Public library, all are welcome. Someplace special. And I've always said those who would have objected to the library being segregated didn't use it that much anyway. This is a very special book for me. It was, I didn't want any anger in it. I didn't want anything to show in it that would be negative. This can be anybody's special place. I get letters from people who say the library is a safe place for them, or that the library was a cool or a warm place for them, that the library was, was a place where they went and experience the magic and wonder of going to other lands and seeing other places and experiencing things that were different. So for me, it was the doorway to freedom, to free thought. When you're being told you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, the library said, you can, you can, you can. 
and I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs>